ਦਿੰਕ ਦਾ ਦਕਸ਼ਣ ਕਿਉਂ ਨਾਸ਼ੇ ਤਬੇ ਇੱਕ ਲੋੜੇ ਤਬੇ ਇੱਕ ਲਾ ਚਲੋ ਇੱਕ ਲਾ ਚਲੋ ਇੱਕ ਲਾ ਚਲੋ ਇੱਕ ਲਾ ਚਲੋ ਰੇ ਜਦੀ ਤੁਰ ਦਕਸ਼ਣ ਕਿਉਂ ਨਾਸ਼ੇ ਤਬੇ ਇੱਕ ਲਾ ਚਲੋ ਰੇ सजनी चैन पावे ना मनवा मार सजनी चैन पावे ना मनवा मार सजनी तोर नैना नैना रे तोर नैना की लागी कटार सजनी let me introduce you to ruhi ruhi i'm handing over to you now yes good evening good evening everyone i ruhi walia sial ehsas women of jalandhar feel delighted to welcome all of you to the tete tete session organized by prabha khetan foundation in association with kahali and with the support of eminent patron sri cement limited as their csr initiative Our special guest for today's tetati is Dr. Deepika Singh Alawat, notable writer Advaita Kala, will engage in a cherishing conversation with Alawat on the YouTube page of Kahali. Tetati is one of the in conversation series of events under the culture and heritage vertical of the foundation. This initiative gives viewers a golden opportunity to connect with eminent personalities and be a part of stimulating conversations. Before I introduce Dr. Deepika Singh Alawat, allow me to share a few words about Prabha Khetan Foundation. Prabha Khetan Foundation, a Kolkata-based non-profit trust, was established by late Dr. Prabha Khetan, an eminent literature enthusiast, cultural activist, and staunch feminist. inspired by the cherished ver- version of late dr prabha khetan and her golden philosophy karma hi jeevan hai the foundation makes its best efforts to create cultural capital through activities and endeavors that propagate literary and cultural gems of india in the past four decades the foundation grew in stature and recognition as an organization that gives the best platform to writers and poets and showcases the spectrum of the cultural heritage of india with the view to work for a better tomorrow the foundation curates events to reach out to more people and enrich their life and stim- with stimulating an intellectual conversation on life literature and cultural diversities the activities of the foundation enjoy pan india and overseas presence all the events are organized in close associ- association with patron sri cement limited distinguished associates partners collaborators and ehsas women of india let me now say a few words about today's session tata t is an in- engaging cultural initiative of prabha khetan foundation it brews up conversation over a cup of tea it is a free wheeling chat with notable personalities 
where notable personalities share insights on a particular topic and enlighten the audience with their experiences and knowledge. The contribution of Advaita Kala deserves special mention. It is because of her Kahali platform and constant support that the foundation successfully organizes virtual tete -tete sessions with eminent personalities from varied walks of life on her online platform that nurtures scope of insightful dialogues and discussions. Our eminent guest for today, Dr. Deepika Singh Allahabad, is a museum curator and art consultant who specializes in cultural history and the politics of historical narrative. Conversationalist Advaita Kala is a notable Indian author, screenwriter, and columnist. She is the screenplay writer of the romantic drama Anjana Anjani and the thriller movie Kahani. She has penned two amazing novels, Almost Single and Almost There. During the COVID-19 outbreak in India, she worked towards social welfare by running a community kit by the name Janta Rasoi in Gurugram. Today's topic is India's missing art scene, which is sure to be exciting and interesting. Without any more delay, let us start the session. Over to you, Advaita, to initiate the conversation with Dr. Deepika Singh Alabat. Over to you. Thanks so much, Ruhi, for that lovely introduction. And I just have to say, I, I say it again on camera, I love your wallpaper. Oh, <laughs> it's just so great. I'll really it you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. All right. But Deepika, thank you so much for joining us all the way from London. I don't know. Quite, oh, it's about one in the afternoon, I guess. There, yeah. around. So I hope you're not eat, eating into your lunch. It's Sunday, so it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's my day off. I also take time off occasionally. You know, okay, <laughs> good to hear that. Uh, but it's lovely to have you back on the platform, and I'm very curious. Uh, for you to first explain to our viewers what exactly it is you do. Because uh, it's very late. Yes, I mean, for, I have many um, sort of hats, but for this particular session, I'm going to talk about my art uh, consultant um, sort of hat, as it were. So I used to work, I have history in as, as a curator in public museums here in, in London as a civil servant. And I now run my own art consultancy. We, we advise museums and individuals globally about art collections. Uh, but my most interesting line of work is is the one in where we advise museums about their path in the future so that they're not carrying the burden of imperial colonialism that often sets the way Western museums are set up and their narrative choices. So we advise them to be sort of more egalitarian uh, in how their collections are formed, how their cultural the narratives are formed, the ideological narratives that museums embody are, are presented for the betterment of the community in which those museums are. Hmm. So that's and pretty then, much what uh, I do. And, and you know, our topic, uh, this was something that you suggested also, was that uh, India's missing art scene. And before we went live, you shared an interesting factoid with us, which was that most high net worth individuals in India don't really spend on art. Like we uh, are billionaires and we have quite a few of them uh, spend the least money on art as compared to their uh, colleagues, I guess, or their contemporaries in other parts of the world. Why is it is it that way, you think? Yes, that's a fact. And that's why, you know, the, the art scene in India is uh, dollar for dollar, much less um, sort of uh, buzzing than in most other art markets. And the art activity scene has shifted far east rather than to India, which should be a major market considering there are so many individuals with ultra high net worth, worth uh, in India, but that's not the case. And I think why that is, is an interesting uh, question, Adrita. Uh, it's very difficult to sort of go into the mind of a billionaire and say, hey, why don't you spend more money on art? But um, I think there are a number of systemic causes, and I think I'm going to try and run through them. Is the screen flickering for anyone or just for me? Um, probably, just... Uh, probably just for me. It's okay. Um, so uh, there are there are a couple of reasons here. One is India's particular history, which, as you know, uh, India, India, a large parts of India were directly ruled by the British, 
until 1947, as I'm sure everyone is aware. But uh, the British were not particular patrons of Indian art. The patronage of Indian art that continued till that point was by Indian aristocracy, which India still retains. But India had a very peculiar sort of, um, uh, so there were two Indias in which traditional Indian arts uh, flourished, which was the India that was not directly ruled by the British. That is, and this contribution to the uh, continuance of Indian traditions, uh, you know, I saw the um, the uh, sort of uh, the introduction about the Prabhakar Khan Foundation's work on art and culture. Much of these traditions of music and dance, for example, only survive because of the patronage that was given to them by the Indian ruling houses. Um, so we have to thank them that despite the fact that we were colonially occupied by the British for almost 200 years for large parts of the country, many of our high cultural traditions still, still survive to the day, which is not the case in most other cultures. If you, if you notice that even though they were not colonized for as long, their idea of high culture and high music and classical music is Western classical music, is Western dance. So if you go to Korea, you go to China, because they've lost a lot of their high culture because there was not adequate patronage to it. So we do have a history of this patronage, but what happened in 1972 with the peculiar clash that happened between India's ruling houses of the past and the government of the day in India under Indira Gandhi, uh, which also led to the abolition of privy purses and all of that, it was um, nothing short of a cultural genocide. I've spoken about this issue before, it's not one that is brought up often because I think people still fear political backlash from bringing it up. But that was a time in which they knew that because they had cut off the privy purses, one of the biggest sources of income for these um, aristocratic houses were, were the art treasures. So they used the law in such a way to prevent them from ever monetizing their art treasures creating laws which essentially meant that the art trade in India completely went underground. Many of these artifacts have been lost to public view forever because, uh, not because they were in any, because they were, the natural owners did not wish to say that they owned them. So they essentially disappeared from sight. Many of them still are missing because nobody wants to take the risk of saying that, hey, I own this. Then many of these have to be registered by, in, uh, by the Archaeological Society of India, and they still remain registered, which means that trade for them remains almost impossible. So I know of many, many paintings of wonderful um, by Western artists, which come under the remit of this act, which cannot be bought or sold in India because they are export restricted. Now, there isn't a market for them in India. So these wonderful paintings are just going to be moldering away because they are export restricted, uh, despite the fact that they're of extreme artistic importance to the history of Western art. So this extremely clumsy law means that trade in art in India isn't going to be as vigorous as it is elsewhere. And because, you know, people buy things when they know that when they want to sell it or have to sell it, they can do so. And in the West, that happens when you invest in art, you can make a lot of money. For example, somebody who bought a Basquiat, say, in 2000 for, I don't know, 100,000 pounds, 200,000 pounds, can now sell it for 20 million, 30 million pounds. I mean, that's one artist. Not all contemporary artists are like that. But the art scene is buzzing everywhere. It isn't buzzing in India. And one of the reasons is the clumsy laws that surround the trade of art, which needs to change. Some, one of the other things is also, um, you can direct me if you think I'm meandering too much, is the social perception of art. Whereas everywhere else, art is seen as an elevating substance or an elevating thing, as a culturally, something that adds cultural value to your life. And someone who buys art is, is seen as someone who has cultural value, um, as is a prestigious thing. In India, it's seen as a frivolous thing. And this started as a Nehruvian platform that any art that wasn't part of state propaganda was seen as a frivolous thing. And therefore, those sort of sentiments have continued to the modern day 
in such a way that art really has liberated itself from those, those sort of ideological and legal shackles, which is why I think the the art uh, scene is still a little bit sluggish and it's going to take uh, a few years for it to really pick up and be on par with anywhere else uh, on the planet. I can't hear you, Advaita. myself apologies i said you're in london which has a very active art scene and i i was i was keen to know uh, what kind of interest do you uh, come across in indian artists when you when you meet with clients and people that you advise on buying art are they are they looking at india for what uh, most auction houses do have an indian and islamic art sort of bunched together for non-contemporary art most of them do have indian contemporary art evenings but it's not as vigorous as say the chinese contemporary art scene i mean the chinese contemporary art scene and far east contemporary art scene is so vigorous that actually the majority of the the most buzzing art market in the world is now hong kong so uh, it's already moved Far East because the Chinese people buy their own art, whether it's contemporary or, or ancient or imperial Chinese art, far more vigorously than Indians are buying openly on the art market. Hmm. Hmm. And, and the other thing that you were talking about also was that you love living where you live because it has an art scene, because it has a museum scene. Uh, Lately, um, especially under Prime Minister Modi now, we are seeing an attempt like the War Memorial, uh, the Prime Minister's Museum, which has come up. Um, there is an attempt to bring sort of museums into the public sphere in a way that has not happened in the past and to engage with them more. So what do you think we're getting right and what are we getting wrong? Because I remember as a kid in Delhi, uh, all we had was like maybe the doll museum and you know the tri tribal arts museum and that was it. But now we're seeing far more attention being given to this. Mm. As a city of uh, more than, uh, what is Delhi's population? Please something more than 10 million, right? 15 million. Not even thought about that, but yeah, huge probably. It should have many more museums, both public and private. So I want to talk about both these things. Private museums, um, uh, I'll come to later, but public museums need to be more autonomous. At the moment in India, museums, state museums are not autonomous. By autonomous, I mean having their own governing bodies with academics and people who are actually trained in the business of art and antiquities and culture uh, to be running them in terms of what they're showing, what is their content, and the logistical running of museums. At the moment, that is not the case. I mean, in India, for example, you could have uh, uh, you know, a, a very well-minded bureaucrat who used to run a dairy uh, board to come and be the director of the museum. They, they do not see that there could be a problem there. And this is obviously not how you run museums. You have trained people who worked in the sector for, for their entire lives who run uh, museums uh, across the world, which is why they're able to get the kind of numbers that they do. I mean, look at the numbers that the Louvre does or the British Museum does, um, and then compare it to the numbers that say the National Museum does, despite having India's huge population. And you will see that there is a difference in the way museums are run. This despite the staff being extremely hardworking, doing whatever they can with the limited resources that they have. I have nothing against the, the, the very hardworking staff at India's National Museums. This is a systemic problem that needs to be solved with policy rather than individuals working hard. So there is that. Uh, so, uh, so public museums make them autonomous so that they have a much more vigorous program which attracts younger people, which attracts people to the museums. Then there are the private museum spaces. I mean, Prabhakatyan Foundation is one such space which looks at cultural, uh, a, a, a variety of pillars of cultural endeavor, but there are not enough museum spaces uh, in India that wealthy corporate houses are building. There are far too few. I mean, there are, I, I mean, at the top of my head, I can only recall a couple. And they need to have far more contemporary art spaces with uh, beautifully designed museums, with quiet spaces, with garden spaces, with art architecture, which invite people into them as a breath of fresh air in a busy city, 
to sort of make art part of the lives of everybody rather than just people who get invited to the opening night at Delhi Art Fair. You know, art isn't meant to be something that is only for the very rich, but the very rich can make it available for everyone. And that is what they should be doing. It's a wonderful investment because A, you get to keep your paintings and you get to share it with everyone else because paintings do not lose their value by other people looking at them or sculpture them. So I think that's my, it's my mission <laughs> to make sure that wealthy people in India start building more museum spaces. That should be what they should be looking at to do in, over the next decade and make a vigorous art program in which you're not only looking at Indian art, but how Indian art and the universality of the human experience across cultures, across mm -hmm. uh, time, so that you know you have contemporary art exhibitions bringing in artists from South Korea, from Japan, from China, from Europe, from South America, and say how did all of them react to, to modernity and modernism, for example, in the early 20th century, and have an exhibition about that. There are a thousand ideas that one could look at. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have an emphasis about museums being ethnographic, it has to be Indian. It has it becomes the it limits what museums and art is. Art is not ethnographic. It is not about proving, hey, my culture is better than yours. It's about proving a universality of human experience. That look, how do people look at death everywhere? How do people look at beauty everywhere? And then bringing that all together, it creates this idea of a universal humanness, which makes us all better people and also definitely more mm -hmm. educated. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very that's very well put, actually. And we, you know, when when one views our own art scene in India and the diversity that we have in the different art forms, and I spend a lot of time actually just going on online and going to art galleries, online art galleries, and looking at different artists and different art. Uh, what do you what do you make of this diversity? Why have we not been able to, you know, like our Pichwai paintings? I mean, I'm just fascinated by the colors and the and the vibrancy and the and the nod to you know um, culture and I I don't know why we're not able to take these on. I mean, they even pop. I find the Pichwai paintings quite poppy, also. You know, why is it that we're not able to share them more with the world? I think we are able to, but it's also this. Uh, Tradition can be both uh, a nurturer and it can be a shackle. So Pichwais were particularly uh, art forms was just like the Christian triptych. It's meant to be in a church. But if you take the form of a triptych painting and take it out into secular painting, which is what happened after the Renaissance in the Western art history movement, then you can make it available to secular art forms and for secular trade. But if you insist that a picture remains within a religious tradition, within the very strict limitations of art and format that the religious tradition allows, it will, it's never going to transcend or to never become a secular art form. Transcend is perhaps the wrong word because it, that signifies elevation. Rather, a transferment is a better, a better word. So artists need to be given more freedom as to, you know, to be able to utilize tradition without being shackled by it. We haven't yet hit that balance well enough, mm -hmm. but there are people doing that. For example, Manjit Bhava's work is based on Indian miniature traditions, but is, is using the oil painting as a medium very successfully. I mean, he's one of my favorite artists so and sells very well on the international art scene too. Not that selling is in any way a, a marker of uh, quality because of course my favorite artist doesn't sell at all because he's only present in one collection and cannot be traded because of the Indian antiquities law. So that does not signify value, but it, it, it allows different people to enjoy the artist's work. And also people who are not from the art world find uh, something to hook on to, oh, this picture sold for 150 million, therefore. It mm. provides a certain kind of a curious interest and hopefully can keep them there by actually looking at the pictures and saying, hey, what's going on here? Let me try and look at this Picasso. Why did it sell for 150 million? And that sort of thing. Mm. And, uh, you know, the other thing, uh, Deepika, you know, I come from the world of books, so whenever there's a new uh, writer who's 
creating a buzz or it's hot or it could even be before the release of a book or after the release of the book of course when the market responds to it uh you know that's how i know a new writer has arrived on the scene how does it work with artists i was i was just cu- i'm just curious to know like how do you know like this kind of artist is going to be hot in the years to come or not mm-hmm. it's very speculative isn't it it is speculative also. but art isn't stock you're not buying it for the sake of hey i want to make profit the pleasure that you get from hanging an art piece over, my, over the like for example i have a 19th century bird picture over my bedroom window bedroom opposite my bedroom wall uh, the pleasure that gives me from looking at that skyscape is immeasurable in money it doesn't matter how much it sells for so that kind of not all art is meant to be monetized but you know uh, the question that you asked has a very complex answer and a probably a very controversial one because in the west there 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 are a certain number of blue chip galleries who pretty much pick and choose which artist is going to be the big one and um they often tend to be uh, the big one so it's a self fulfilling prophecy in many ways that's how the art trade works mm-hmm. but you cannot take the art trade away from the art market because artists need to live the entire sort of trade and everybody is dependent on it in terms of making their livelihood they all need to live art cannot survive in a vacuum of hey live in a garret and make no money that just is a romantic nonsense that is perpetrated by narrative about art that's not how artists should work you should not be consigning artists to living in poverty for being artists so you know you do have extremely wealthy artists all right do have sorry all writers exactly yes this entire yes. trade you know this entire early late 19th century early 20th century tortured artists living in an attic yeah. needs to go it needs to go hmm hmm i can agree with you more uh you know a uh, 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 a lot of times party conversation you know a lot of people come in and say oh uh, you know i bought this piece of art and now it's selling for this much i bought it 10 years ago and now it's worth this much <laughs> that that becomes that's interesting dinner table conversation but what it also does and i'm not talking about like aficionados i'm talking about the lay person who listens in on that conversation uh, they're saying that oh, oh you know this is then linked to the financial aspect and if i'm going to put this kind of money in to a piece of art then i should get something in return which is which is sort of also the indian mindset in a in a, to an extent uh the It indian is. mindset mm-hmm. even if you're wealthy would be to buy jewel gold because you know that gold will appreciate and, and it's something you can pass on to your, your family and your children and all of those things how do you make Mm-hmm. I think there's a little bit of an echo. If you finished your question, I think I gathered what how does art appreciate. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. So if the question is does art appreciate as well as gold? Yes. The answer is that yes, art art performs gold by many fold in the past um 20 years certainly. So if you buy and have a good consultant, you'll probably make much more money in art than you would have buying gold. but um as i gave you the example of a basquia if you bought a basquia in the 80s if you were lucky enough to buy a basquia for a few hundred dollars you would be sitting you would be making 20 30 50 million depending upon which picture you're selling today so nothing appreciates like like an like a blue chip artist so uh, but that's not what but you're looking and the fun thing is that you get to look at a basquia painting and no matter how many people look at it and consume it its value only appreciates there are very few things in the world that are like that that many people could consume and the value only appreciates and you can you can consume it eternally as long as that art will work last so we're looking at a question of posterity and time which really doesn't apply to many other consumables um so yeah art performs better that is not the as i said the the art laws in india prevent art from being traded in a way that uh prevents people perhaps from investing in it as freely as they should be doing but the contemporary art scene is certainly more vigorous than than say 
the historical art scene because the Arts and Antiquities Act means that any painting that, that is over 100 years old becomes an antiquity irrespective of what it is. It, I mean, I could put a smear of paint on a paper and that would have to be registered. And, you know, uh, that's how badly it written the law is. So, uh, so, so there are people who have art in their collections but can't sell it because of this uh, the, the peculiarity of the, this poorly written law. So clearly that needs to be amended and that's definitely going to create uh, far more buzz in this uh, sector. But also more uh, to the point, this law needs to be separated from art, contemporary art, secular art, from religious and culturally important art pertaining to religion. So temple sculpture, for example, should not be traded in the same way because these are not secular, secular artifacts. They belong to a temple and, you know, they, they need, they should not be traded as, as say, a Brancusi, for example. A Chola Nataraja is not a Brancusi. And that distinction needs to be written into the law, which allows both of them to go to people who will treat them as, 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 as separate entities, but which allows the trade of both openly uh, in a manner which is registered, which is transparent, which allows public scholarship, which allows public display, which allows access to the public to them, et cetera, et cetera, which is not happening at the moment. You made this distinction between secular art and art religious expre expression but how do you even make that accessible because there are so many stereotypes about the pantheon for example of hindu gods in abroad in the west especially how do you how can you use art to familiarize people with our culture, our civilizational heritage, our Hindu heritage? Um, to me, the goal of Indian art uh, is for Indian people. Uh, everybody else is secondary. So to me, they're not the primary goal of how art should be seen or received. It is for Indians to see it. Um, they can learn and it will benefit them to learn because it is uh, India is a major world civilization. But it, do I sort of toss and turn thinking, oh, my God, this random white person does not understand Shiva? No, I don't. It's not. That's not mm -hmm. the importance of Shiva. Shiva needs to be understood by people who believe in Shiva, which is Indians and Hindus. Hmm. But to, but if if you want to use art as a way of conversation as well, right? Because it is it mm -hmm. is part of our soft power. It is part. We have centuries of it. And, yeah. and not only, you know, I, like, I, I, oh, I see your point. I see your point. Do we use Shivanath Raja as a way of, hey, this come to understand Indian culture? There are many Indian galleries in, in numerous Western museums. Most of their uh, collections can be, and this will go to our issue of repatriation that we spoke about. How does this work? Yes. On yes. How well do they need to come back to the temples they were taken from? So it's a much more. Uh, the thing is that if Indian uh, temple art is collected in the same way that, say, Greek temple art is collected, it cannot be because Hinduism is a living religion. The Greek paganism is dead. So mm. if Western museums will collect them in the same way, they're committing a fundamental error of belief. So that needs to be corrected. And when India has enough soft power, the soft power will need to have be an iron hand in the world of love to say, no, you do not do that anymore. That's mm. it. Mm. Mm. Yes, and uh, you know, part of the reason why I ask that question is because very often you will see, uh, for example, Ganesha on a on a on a bath mat or on a seat cover or on a pair of slippers. And and you know, there isn't quite that appre it's it's sort of funky and cool and trippy. Uh, but it is for them, but they don't really quite understand the art. No, that's, that's just because cultural appropriation. And now more and more Indians are getting absolutely on the dot. I mean, they, they sort of protest against it straight away. I mean, I as you know, I follow the K-pop scene. And one of yeah. the major sort of girl groups, Blackpink, had a, had a, a Ganesh Murthy in one of the backgrounds of their sets randomly, without reference, without any kind of just randomly as a bric-a-brac. 
And of course, you know, the Indian K-pop fans were up in arms. They were like, apologize straight away. And they, they had to, they didn't issue an apology, which is, is you know, which should have happened, but uh, they did remove it from the video. So Indians, the young Indians are extremely on it. You do not appropriate our gods and then get away with it. So it's more about knowledge and being able to express their, their opinions quite strongly online. And that's happening. So, uh, you know, as uh, more cultures become familiar with ours and we become familiar with more cultures, because it's not as if Indians are not committing these acts of cultural appropriation and degradation all the time in ignorance for other cultures. We are too. Anyone is capable of doing it. I, I probably am too uh, all the time without doing it. So we just have to be open to learning and appreciating the fact that we need to be more respectful of other people's cultural traditions. Right. And 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 this is really I wanted to bring this up to us the end, you know, the end of our conversation was because you did correctly point out that it's a whole other discussion, but I think it's important and it's something I know that our viewers will be interested in. Is the rep repatriation of art and and the Kohinoor and Tipu Sultan's treasures and all of those things uh, that uh, have traveled out of this country during a long uh, period of colonialism. How do we go about it? How do we get it back? So I believe some are already offering back these antiquities, uh, thanks in large measure to Prime Minister Modi's you know, soft diplomacy and being seen around the world as a visible and a strong leader, and now one of the most senior world leaders, elected leaders. So. Uh, how do we how do we go about this without being offensive or obnoxious? There is nothing to be offensive, uh, offensive or obnoxious about getting your own stuff back that was stolen. Uh, yeah. Who has every right for these things to be repatriated? And Britain's um, defense in this case is that oh, we don't know who to return it to. Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and of course the easiest solution to that is to get a non-compete uh, treaty from Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, for mm -hmm. India, for the Kohinoor, and for other uh, Indian antiquities, and then set up a dedicated museum to these repatriated treasures. So as soon as Pakistan signs a non-compete clause, Britain does not have a leg to stand on legally as to whether or not the Kohinoor should be repatriated. And and basically, Pakistan standing signing that clause is something that we'll have to wait a while for. We'll have to make it worthwhile for a country which is struggling financially. It should not be. It should not be that difficult. And let us not forget that Pakistan is not Britain's friend either. Mm -hmm. Well, one doesn't know who is Britain's friend very often, but we won't go there. That's a political I mean, conversation. In the sense that Pakistan was as much a victim of colonization as, as India was. So, you know, there is no reason for it to, to sort of, you know, cut off its nose to spite its face. There is very good reason for cooperation here, and there should be no reason why this, this cooperation should not happen. Let's not forget the Kohinoor was mined in the Golconda. So there is no logical or historical reason for it to belong to anyone else except to India. Hmm. Thank you for that. And Ruhi, I want to ask you if you have any questions for Deepika as well, since we have her with us. You're on mute. Very, very interesting session we've had. And uh, yes, I agree with what you said that, you know, art, uh, which is, of course, stolen from India, should uh, come back. And of course, there are going to be ways or whatever it may be. Um, in terms of Indians, you know, the general public as well is very, very interested in, you know, seeing there should be a place where they can go and, you know, See these artifacts that have been stolen. There is this. Um, uh, it's it's a vessel that was uh, that that was blessed by one of the gurus, uh, guru um, one of the one of the Sikh gurus, which apparently has lots of holes in it. It's called the Ganga Sagar. We had a chance that uh, this gentleman uh, who lives in Pakistan, he's he stored it in his. Uh, you know, in his safe in London. He's, and uh, he brings it to India once in a while. And, uh, you know, the community, the Sikh community, uh, you know, gets the chance to see it and, you know, to 
so I, I see that India is, even the local public, and it's placed sometimes in the Gurdwara, and there are a lot of, lot of people who want to see it. So I feel there should be a place where, you know, the history of, you know, this, which is lying in different parts, which belongs to India, should be brought back. You know, so, so very true. interesting, very, very interesting. Yeah. And Deepika, you know, just uh, for, uh, for our viewers and uh, those on a limited budget who do want to start collecting art, what, were, what would be the tips that you would offer? So for art, buy what you like. At a greater collecting stage, you can afford an art consultant like me. I'm not cheap, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, Most of you are making a call. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> but we should... Uh, but buy what me gives you pleasure, because as I said, not all are not the entire experience of art is not meant to be monetized. It's about hey, I look at this and it gives me great joy, and that should be the primary reason for you buying. If you're spending a thousand, two thousand back of pounds and looking at a painting, and also look at the help that you're giving to someone who has put their life's work into making a picture, because you know all artists start out struggling, not knowing what they're doing. Not all artists do not start off as being successful unless there are like a pop star who starts painting or something of the sort. But, uh, you know, so buy what gives you pleasure and um, then be guided by, uh, you know, an art gallery which you trust or when you become, when you have the means, hire an art consultant who can advise your, your the formation of the collection, which um, you can use. Uh, both to monetize, maybe sell later, to be in the auction market, uh, or to be simply hang in your in your house or place of work, and that joy that of looking at art or looking at something that is beautiful is immeasurable. It gives you immeasurable joy. It's an already that investment is already returned just by the joy of looking at it. And also the joy it sparks in others who look at it. You know, don't forget that people who visit your house look at it. It's an it's a source of unending consumption that people can continue to look at it. And one of the beauties of art, of course, is that the owner cannot look at it better than someone who does not own it. You see? So when I look at a picture, say I look at a Basquiat that is owned by, say, uh, the, uh, Japanese billionaire A, he cannot see more in it than I do, or mm -hmm. I can consume it as much as he does. It doesn't matter who owns the art because the basic consumption of art is in the seeing of it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in India, you have politicians making art and then selling it. And you, I don't think there's much of an option of buying when people do buy their art in some that, parts. That unfortunately has been the case. Uh, all people, anybody can write and anybody can paint. paint well, yeah. Good is a different bit. That's so true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a minuscule budget and I'm going to say, find me something. Because I was thinking of the same, by the way. Challenge, challenge you to find me something on this little tiny budget. I have. We have an affordable art fair in London for precisely the startup collectors. Collectors are starting to buy. So, uh, so I do take some of my my clients there and say, "Hey, have a look." I want I want you to have a connection with with an artwork, and then you know, then, then so we true. can sort of build up from there. Yeah. So true. But thank you so much. It's been a lovely and such an informative conversation. And I'm so grateful that you took the time out on your Sunday. And I know that you love to follow a schedule. So I'm going to take too much of more of your time and I'm going to hand over to Ruhi. Thank you so much. What an insightful and interesting session it was. On behalf of Prabha Ketan Foundation, I would like to thank Dr. Deepika Singh Alavad for an engaging talk on India's missing art scene. Many thanks to Advaita Kala for hosting today's session on her YouTube channel Kahali and conversing with Dr. Alavad. I would also like to express my sincerest gratitude to patron 3 Cement Limited and associate Kahali. Last but not the least, a big thank you goes for the viewer, viewers who took out precious time from their busy schedule and attended the online chat session. Goodbye, take care, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And Thank we'll you. see you at 7 p.m. 
uh, for the Sunday Club. So those of you who asked on the chat, we'll be back. Bye for Thank now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me.